I'm going to digress for a couple of minutes here to talk about neuroprotection. And this is something that was mentioned earlier in the class, but briefly. And so we're going to come back to this now because it's very important uh, with regard to what the topic is today, brain-derived neurotropic factor, BDNF. And there are, really, there are a, a lot of different molecules in the brain that have this ability to protect the brain, neurotropic uh, proteins. Uh, several of those have been identified. Also, omega-3 fatty acids, uh, that is also neuroprotective. We'll talk about that later on. But this is the one that's gotten the most study, probably the most important one uh, in the human brain. So we're going to talk a little bit about this. And there are four uh, major things that BDNF, do, uh, what, what it does. And the amount of BDNF a person uh, is making and then releasing is in part uh, determined by genetics. There are people born into their life with the uh, inability to make adequate amounts of BDNF. On the other end of the spectrum are people that genetically are predisposed to make a lot of it. In fact, they may have not just one gene, but they may have two or three genes that code for BDNF. And so they are capable of, of making a lot more of this protein. So there you have genetics playing a role uh, accounting for individual differences. So going to the diagram here, I mean the PowerPoint slide, it's essential for cell repair. And uh, this 100 billion cells, nerve cells that people have, you gotta hang on to them if at all possible over a lifespan. So somebody, somebody's gonna live to be 80 years old. Uh, just the effects of aging alone can be tremendously uh, damaging to the brain. And if you add on top of that things like head injuries and early child abuse and God knows what else, uh, the brain really takes a big hit. So part of what BDNF does is it helps to facilitate natural repair mechanisms to keep these cells viable so they're up and running, like doing cell maintenance. The next thing is, is very interesting, uh, and this has been discovered, I think, on, uh, only more recently, pardon me, and that is, if you've got BDNF in the brain, and by the way, it's, uh, BDNF is made in glial cells, and then uh, it's released into the fluid surrounding nerve cells. If you have enough BDNF, and then the brain is subject to being uh, really basically overrun by toxic levels of cortisol, BDNF can literally uh, bind to the cortisol molecule and cut it in half and that renders it non-toxic. So at the level of the cell, it's like the guardian of the cell. It's not going to get rid of all the cortisol, but it's going to be able to neutralize some of the cortisol that otherwise could potentially cause brain damage. Excuse me. <clears throat> okay. Uh, neurogenesis plays a role in activating the production of new nerve cells, which uh, occur uh, almost exclusively in the hippocampus. Uh, thank goodness. I mean, this is really great because that's one part of the brain that takes a big hit from hyperpersilemia, but it's got the capacity to produce new nerve cells and also cell growth. But here's the problem, okay? The problem is uh, with depression and also prolonged periods of severe stress with powerlessness, you get a dramatic decrease in the amount of BDNF. Now, what, one thing that's very interesting, and thank goodness for this, is about two years ago, a neuroscientist by the name of Ron Duman uh, discovered that you can measure BDNF levels in a blood test, and that that will reflect very closely the amount of BDNF that's available in the brain. In addition, uh, what he's been able to demonstrate is that when people develop uh, major depression, okay, and it's accompanied by toxic levels of cortisol, and it, but you treat the depression, and the treatments can be medication, uh, but also other treatments as well, exercise, psychotherapy, and so forth. Uh, but most of the studies have been with medication. That as the person begins to experience remission, you start to see significant increases in BDNF that you can pick up with a simple blood test. So this is, this is not kind of ready for prime time right now. Uh, but I, my guess is that in the fairly near future, uh, it will be a part of clinical evaluation that psychiatrists, primary care doctors may be able to, to uh, evaluate, and that's good. Now, let's go back then to talking about BDNF. You can see on the, on the PowerPoint slide, uh, BDNF, significant decrease in that occurs uh, in about 60% of people that have major depression. Also about 60% of people 
that have hyper, uh, the depression have hypercortisolemia. And it's not clear if one causes the other or vice versa, but they co-occur. So the likelihood is, I mean, the theory is that high cortisol levels actually reduce BDNF levels, but that's, that's, just a, that's just a theory. But maybe that doesn't make any difference. The thing is, you start getting hypercortisolemia and BDNF uh, at the same time, so you've taken out of the equation the protein that could otherwise protect the brain and to repair it. Now, here are the things that uh, have been found that are, can be effective in activating gene expression for BDNF, okay? The first are antidepressants. And what's interesting about this are the antidepressants uh, uh, that have the, this impact on increasing BDNF are from all the different classes of antidepressants. So it's not just uh, SSRIs like, uh, you know, like Zoloft and Prozac and so forth. Uh, it's also the drugs like Welbutrin that target dopamine and norepinephrine the drugs that are called SNRIs, the serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors like Effexor, for instance, and, and Remeron. So all the different classes share one thing in common, and that is they increase BDNF. Now, having said that, uh, St. John's Wort and SAMe are effective in treating major depression if they're treated with very, very high doses. And this is what happens in, in many European countries where these drugs are, are used a lot. In fact, uh, in Italy, SAMe is the top-selling antidepressant. In Germany, St. John's Wort is the top-selling antidepressant. Okay. Now, now, the point I want to make though regarding BDNF is there just hasn't been, there haven't been to date, at least not that I can discover, any studies that have looked at uh, you know BDNF levels uh, for people that are being treated with these two over-the-counter products. Now, I would bet you that they they do activate BDNF, but the data is not there yet. Now. Also, and it's a bit of a digression, but I think this is really important. There are people who have severe depression. They, uh, you know, really could benefit from uh, treatment, including psychotherapy and, and very likely antidepressants. But they say, "Well, no, 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 no. I'm not gonna. I'm not taking any drugs." And there's lots of different reasons people don't want to take drugs, and lots of legitimate reasons, and it's their their right, you know, to. Uh, to choose what their treatments are. But one thing I think we can tell people that might be on the fence about this is that the way antidepressants work, and this may be the main effect of antidepressants, is to activate what really is a naturally occurring brain protein. Uh, and, and it a lot of the experts believe this is the main thing that antidepressants do. Now, they do other things as well. Uh, but it, we're presenting to, to the patient that in a very real sense, then the drug, it's not the drug per se, but its ability to activate something that should be occurring naturally. This is in great contrast to things like tranquilizers uh, or, for that matter, alcohol. Somebody is really anxious, they can take Xanax and, you know, for six hours they're more calmed down, but then the anxiety comes back. It hasn't fundamentally changed anything. Uh, also, like drinking five beers, yeah, you can get really mellow with that, but it doesn't, uh, it only produces a drug effect and it's transient. So, the, the whole idea about, uh, well, you know what, it's really about activating something in the brain that is going to be occurring, you know, with everybody who doesn't have clinical depression. So, maybe that makes sense, okay? Anyway, uh, now the uh, next bullet item are drugs that are used to treat bipolar disorder. And also, uh, you can see here Depakote, Tegretol, Equitro, and Lamictal. All of those were originally drugs that were uh, approved for treating epilepsy, and they were discovered to have an impact on bipolar disorder. I should say, as an aside, uh, there are some anticonvulsant medications that are used for e treating epilepsy that have no effect on mood. Uh, it's like uh, Dilantin, for instance, and... Uh, and phenobarbital, okay? But these do, and they're FDA approved for treating bipolar disorder. Uh, and lithium, of course, is up there as well. Now, of these medications, the one that uh, has the, the greatest impact on BDNF is lithium. And, and uh, it, it's really sort of the BDNF workhorse. And let me just give you one, uh, talk about one study for just a moment, and, and actually just after I make the, get through with this slide, then we're gonna take a break, okay? There's a study coming out of Scandinavian countries where they have socialized medicine and they track people's health, as we've talked about before, uh, real closely. And one study has shown that people have been on long-term lithium treatment. So most of these people would be bi have bipolar disorder, although lithium can be used as an adjunct medication for 
uh, treatment resistant depression, but they looked at these people that have been taking lithium for like 30, uh, 20, 30, 40 years, and when they get to old age, they have half the rate of Alzheimer's disease. Now, there have been two studies that I've seen where they tried to use lithium to treat Alzheimer's disease, and one of these showed some improvement, but it wasn't statistically significantly better, and the other study did not show any major effect. But what we're probably looking at here from those Scandinavian countries is not using it to treat the disorder, but having decades of exposure to lithium might, in fact, uh, result in an abundance of, of this protective protein. And then when the people get to this particular age, a lot, uh, a lot of them are not going to get Alzheimer's disease that they might have gotten otherwise. Uh, Seroquel, it's the uh, only antipsychotic that increases BDNF, and uh, I, the drug company certainly didn't design it this way, but it's, it's a, a nice feature. And it's probably part of the reason the Seroquel is one of the top-selling drugs in the country. And then finally is voluntary exercise. And uh, I want to just talk about this for a moment, then we'll take our break. What's so interesting here is if, if you, uh, you know, put a running wheel in a cage with a gerbil or a mouse or what have you, they, they like to run, okay? So they'll get on there and they'll run. Uh, however, they've done studies where they take these same lab animals and they have a control group which has uh, no running wheel. Okay? They have a group that has a running wheel that they can choose whether they want to run on or not. And then they have a group where they put the animal inside of a running wheel that you can't get out of. It's got uh, walls on the side of it, and, and it's electric, meaning it keeps moving. If you want to stop, it won't let you stop. You basically have to keep, keep moving. And what's so cool about the study is that they, they yoked the two experimental groups, okay? So you have the one group that is uh, choosing voluntarily to get on the running wheel. And when that guy does that, it turns on the running wheel for the other guy. So they both get exposure to the exact same um, uh, duration uh, and intensity of exercise. And what's cool is this, and that is, I think you know the punchline, the, the uh, animals that uh, chose to exercise had increases in BDNF, and those that just ran, because they were forced to, didn't. And so let me just speculate for a moment, and that is when people experience profound stress accompanied by powerlessness, maybe it makes sense, and, and, and that turns off BDNF, okay, maybe it makes sense that to have a sense of mastery and control may activate it. Now, I'm just wild speculation here, but I, yeah, I think that's a real possibility. <laughs> 